Well, welcome today to our webinar, our eAcademy webinar uh, on Accordance as the Ultimate Reading Companion with Brian Davidson. Uh, we do have a question section there in our GoToWebinar control panel, and we will be taking those questions um, as we go along. Uh, Brian will pause from time to time, so please go ahead and put your questions there in the question section. Also, we're recording this, and you will receive that recording about an hour after this webinar is over. So with that, um, I am going to hand it over to you, Brian. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming. Um, my goal today is to break down uh, a myth and to help you with a problem. So the myth is that Bible software is just for complex searches frequently in school and in libraries and amongst those people that are interested in studying scripture. A lot of times, especially if, you know, the people that love books, print books, they think about Bible software as just a specialty tool to do a complex search and those sorts of things. So in my experience, Bible software is fantastic as a daily reading companion. And how does that work? Well, that's where I want to help you. Uh, how can you set your laptop next to your, your Bible and use it to answer the questions that arise? Because most of the time when we're studying scripture, I mean, it's reading, right? You've got the text in front of you and your goal is simply to read. That's the daily practice. And that's where I find that accordance can be super helpful. Um, now, there will be some specialty searches along the way, uh, but I want to show the reading companion aspect in this webinar. So some people, there, there's, a, there's a problem. So the myth is, is that, and the reality is it's a good reading companion as well. The problem is that when people sit down and try to use their software, a lot of times the workspace just keeps getting added onto and it turns into a mess and it's just not easy to use. They they get uh, so many tabs open and so many zones open. And so I think if if you know how to use workspaces, it can really reduce the chaos and sort things out. And so that's what I want to show you how to do. So I uh, currently teach Latin and Greek here in the Atlanta area, and I've done so for about 10 years. I went to Southern Seminary and did an MDiv and went a long ways down a PhD program and took comprehensive exams and did all the classes and stepped out with a THM um, and just continued teaching in high school. I sort of fell in love with, with that. So that's what I'm doing. That's where my experience with these sorts of things uh, uh, grew out of. So um, if what you see on your screen right now, I'm going to take my video camera off. I think that should do it. Hopefully everybody's screen just got a little bigger. I want to show you the handout that I've posted. Um, there should be a link to this handout as well as the actual PDF itself in the handout section. The link will always be more up to date um, because I'm probably going to find a typo in here and fix it. And then I'll save that and the link will update. So this gives you an overview of where we're headed. Um, I want to start with the most complex workspace. Uh, all the things, the all the things workspace, label it as you would like. That's my name for it. And you'll notice throughout the handout in red, these are the questions that I'm trying to answer um, in this workspace. Next, I want to take out a workspace. Uh, I want to look at a workspace designed to uh, give you the room and setup to use the text command. Um, there's a there's a little more to this one, but the the question is pretty simple. You know, when you're reading the Septuagint or you're reading the Hebrew Bible, and that question arises of, well, how does the Septuagint treat this word, or vice versa? So that's what we'll look at there. Accordance also has a super powerful ability to help you find similar wording. So way beyond your cross-reference resources or the margins of NA28, um, the, the infer search in Accordance is amazing, not just for tracking down you know, allusions and these sorts of things, 
but even for those times when you you know that you've read something similar before and you just can't remember where it is uh, the infer search is awesome for that so we'll look at that where else is this language used that's the question I'll give you some examples too uh, Old Testament is a completely different ball of wax when it comes to textual criticism so in my in the PhD classes and coursework I did, that was where I focused, was on Old Testament textual criticism, and it's just a completely different animal uh, compared to New Testament, where with New Testament, you've got so many different um, Greek manuscripts. In the Old Testament, it's, a, it's really different. You've got your uh, Masoretic tradition represented mainly in Leningrad, and then you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, but you've got to lean on all these other um, versions like the Old Latin, the Vulgate, uh, the Syriac, etc. <clears throat> so Accordance makes this unbelievably amazing. This right here might be one of my favorite things about Accordance all altogether is the um, way that you can just pop up other versions. So we'll take a look at that. And if we get there, uh, I want to show you a simple reading companion after looking at all this complex stuff. Uh, we'll take a look at then finally a digital reading uh, workspace. What does it look like if you don't have your print text in hand and you want to read 100% digitally? So, all right, that's where we're headed. Uh, let's get started with the all the things workspace. So, this is what it looks like. Um, I told you that my goal was to help you sort through the clutter. When you first take a look at this, it might look a little cluttered but keep looking you know let your eyes settle like those pictures with all the dots and you'll see the image um, on the top left here in what i'm calling zone one top you've got your your tagged texts and i've got basically everything here this webinar or e-academy seminar uh, is geared towards assisting your original language reading so that's what i've got here hebrew bible septuagint Roth's. Um, the Vulgate and uh, Greek New Testament. Um, this zone is primarily for amplifying. All right. So let me show you all the different things that we can do with this and why I call it the All the Things workspace. Um, if you want to find out what a lexicon has to say about a word, right, all you got to do is triple click and go there. So one, two, three, and I'm in DCH. If I want to see all the different versions, uh, on, on Exodus 9, 19, I click the verse reference and there we have it. We've got a translation and we've got the primary versions ready to roll. If I wanna take a look at um, a commentary, I can click on anchor and there's a quick look at what a commentary has to say. Um, if I wanna search the text and stay in a tag text, um, not jump down here to a uh, live click or anything like that, but I want to search and stay in a tag search window. All I have to do is double click, command four, and there we have it. And I can scroll through my results. Um, if I want to see a word and all of its occurrences in the Hebrew Bible and other literature as well, well, I can click where's a good one? These are common words. Uh, I, where did that cloud word go? I can click one time. And there it is, down in the bottom right down here, I've got the Hebrew Bible, the Ensira, uh, I've got Qumran, and everything is ready to go. I can then maximize that, take a look at it, scroll through my results, pop it back down, and I'm ready to go. So this is the Swiss knife, uh, Swiss army knife of question answering Bible reading power, all right? <laughs> um, that was a quick overview of what all it can do. I do want to walk through and break it, break this workspace down for you. So um, I just wanted to show you briefly there at the front end what all that we could do here. So again, my vision is you have your laptop with this screen open sitting beside your print text. And when you have a question, you turn here um, for answers. Okay, so let's look at each zone. Here, this is one zone on the left. The top one again has our tag texts. On the top right, what I'm calling zone two, if you notice in the handout, I labeled the zones in blue, how I might refer to them. We've got a, a full 
uh, Hebrew lexicon here, the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew. Uh, we've got one that covers both all Greek. So I'm using the Brill Dictionary here uh, because it would take care of the Septuagint and the New Testament and anything else I would want to look up. And then we've got a Latin lexicon ready to roll as well. So those all live there. And uh, I can triple click and, and jump straight to it. On the bottom right, we've got two different, uh, two different live click uh, panels here. We've got the verse lookup tab. So that's for clicking a reference and jumping down there to see other versions. And then we've got the word usage tab, another live click. So this, I go here, if I click a verse reference, I go here, if I live click a word, all right. So, and then finally we've got the info pane. That's what's happening over here at the bottom of zone one. Now my info pane looks a little different maybe uh, to yours. I've got it in a text only view. If you click the gear icon, you can determine how that shows up. I uncheck show book covers simply because I could get more info packed in that bottom left corner by doing that. So now I can see all five of my top study Bibles and all five of my commentaries uh, without moving too much. Because think about it, when you're using anything uh, as an aid to reading, the more friction there is between you and the information, the less likely you are to go to it. That's one of the problems with Bible software that a lot of people run into is it takes so many clicks and frustration and friction to get where they want to go. And so I'm trying to help minimize that. So all of that is my overview of what's here. OK, the way that I want to proceed is like the handout does. Um, I want to talk about questions and how to answer them. So. Before I take any questions, I want to stop multiple times for questions, but before we do that, let's run through a couple of these questions that might arise. When you're reading a print text, one of the main questions that might arise is what would a lexicon have to say, right? Even if you're using a reader's Bible, which we have a abundance of now, thank the Lord. Um, even if you're using a reader's Bible, there are times when you see a, a gloss in the footnote for a Hebrew or Greek word, and you're like, yeah, but what would a full lexicon have to say? All right. So a, a, my preferred way to answer that question is just to navigate um, to the passage here. When you're navigating to your passage, you know, maybe you started in Exodus 19.7, but then now you're in 18. You could scroll down, but remember two taps on the tab command. And if you notice down here, um, Exodus 19, 7 is, is highlighted. If you're now in verse 10, you can just type that in real quick and jump to it, right? Or maybe you're actually in Exodus 21. So two taps, I can just put in Exodus 21, and there we go. So um, navigate to where your verse is and simply triple click. Now, I prefer triple clicking because it also, if you're in a full lexicon like DCH, it's going to also highlight the, um, the verse reference. You don't see it. We're at the beginning of the entry, right? We don't see the part where it mentions, mentions Exodus 21.1. But to get there, all we have to do is hit Option Command down. And now we're there, ready to check out our instance. So I apologize, I don't know the window shortcuts, but generally speaking, um, command is... Control, alt. control and option is, is alt. It, option is alt. So control is the command substitute and alt is the option substitute. Now, another keyboard shortcut that's super important to remember is magnifying that zone when you're working in a tight constrained workspace like this especially on my screen which is 13 inches um, all you have to do is hit command option m to magnify that zone that's super helpful when you're reading right so and then again command option m to make it small again and you don't lose your place right everything's still set up and ready to go you're ready for the next question the next question might be vastly different than what does dch have to say about mishpat so 
again, it's just a simple triple click. And then command option M, you can jump down to your research results, command option M, put it back and keep reading. All right, the quicker we can get the information and get back to our reading, uh, the better. That sounds like blasphemy in some circles. Uh, some circles would say that you need to expend a long time getting the print lexicon off the shelf and flipping through the pages because all this time you spend is benefiting your memory on helping you remember the information, right? So if you spend longer looking it up and spend longer finding the entry, that's a good thing. And it does have its benefits, but there's also benefits to getting through more text. That's my goal in reading. It doesn't have to be your goal, but I want to get through the Hebrew Bible and the Septuagint multiple times, many times in my lifetime. I don't want to spend 40 years on my one read through of the Hebrew Bible. So there's there's other benefits to that way of reading. All right. So um, once you're over here in DCH, um, remember, too, that if you want to see what Hallett has to say, there's a quick keyboard shortcut for that. It, on a Mac, if you hit control and then hit a number. So control and a number will allow you to cycle through your lexicons. I just hit control one and it took me to the concise dictionary of classical Hebrew. That doesn't have the Exodus 21 one hit. So that's why it gave me the error. I could take that off and then run the search and go to it. But more times than not, that's not going to be what I'm doing. I, I'm going to want to go to from DCH to Hallett. Uh, and so I can, and it doesn't have it either. So that's fine. I can take that off and hit enter and I'm in Hallett. So control plus a number will allow you to jump around in your uh, lexica according to the order that you've got them set up in your library. All right. So now we're back to normal. All right, so that's about all I've got to say on what would a lexicon have to say. So triple clicking and um, using the control number to cycle through the lexicons and command option uh, down to jump to the hit. All right, one other thing that I would like to cover before we take questions there is what would another version or translation have to say? I think these are the two most frequent questions. What would a lexicon have to say and what would another version slash translation have to say? Now, to do that, I use LiveClick. So when this came out um, a year or two ago, this was... I think it was the best thing that's ever happened to Bible software. I've, I've written blog posts about just focused on live click setups, which I didn't include in this, but they're on the, the website there. When I want to answer the question, what would another translation say? All I do is click the verse reference, and there it is. Now, when you click a verse reference in live click and, and use that live click feature, what shows up for you is not going to be this set of resources unless you've got it set up. And so I do want to show you, I want to take the time to show you what my live click settings are and how to get this set up. What I've got down here is one translation at the top because the reason I do that is because a lot of times that's what I want. Right? I want to know how would a modern translation say this. And the reason I've got the NRSV at the top is because it'll cover all the bases, right? Um, whatever text I'm reading, it's going to be in there. It's got the, a broad canon. Um, and then I've got the primary Old Testament versions. So we've got the Masoretic text, we've got uh, the Göttingen Septuagint, and also Rolf's, because sometimes there's not a Göttingen Septuagint for, for a book that you want, say Proverbs. We've got the Vulgate, um, again, the backup Septuagint being Rolf's. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, Targum all the, the combined Targum module here. Uh, we've got the Old Testament Peshitta and then the Vedas Latina. We'll talk about this more in depth here in a second once we get to a different workspace on these different versions. But the short um, story is that uh, Vedas Latina is based on the Septuagint. So this Latin frequently differs from the Vulgate. 
because the Vulgate is a Hebrew translation into Latin and Vedas Latina is for a Septuagint uh, translation into Latin. So that's super helpful with Septuagint textual criticism um, and the Hebrew Bible. And then finally, the Samaritan Pentateuch is there. And I've got these ordered really in what do I want to see most frequently? So the Hebrew Bible, Septuagint, and Vulgate are at the top. So now there's not just live click settings that go into this. It's the, the user group or what should I call it? Uh, resource group that I've called ancient Bibles. Now, that, that is the kind of thing you set up in your library. When you want to create a collection like this, it's not difficult. Um, all you got to do is find the text you want to include, um, two-finger click or right-click on those, and hit Add to User Group. I was wondering today where I got the verbiage of user group, and there it is. I was not wrong. It is called a user group. And then here I've got a, just a few uh, ancient Bibles. Again, that's the one on the bottom right of the screen now, and primary texts that we're going to look at in just a second. So add whatever you want to ancient Bibles, throw you in there a uh, translation to put at the top two, and you can crush the most frequent questions just by having the lexicon open and this uh, live click verse lookup set up. Um, Let's take a look at the live click settings that make this happen. Um, in, in the text that I have live click turned on, I just click the gear and go down to live click. I don't have lexicon lookup turned on because I just showed you how to triple click and get that info. Uh, I do have verse lookup turned on. It's set to the text browser and I told it to use a custom group which I called ancient Bibles. Uh, word usage is, is where we're headed next, and we'll look at that setting when we get there. Okay, uh, let me take one or two questions, if we have any, about these two questions. Um, answering what would a lexicon have to say and what would other versions have to say. Do we have any, Linda? Uh, we have one question. Can oh, you no. share? Uh, can you show us your ancient Bible group in the library? Question. I meant to do that. So when you scroll down to the bottom, that's where you find these. I've got a couple workspaces saved. I better close that. Um, in groups, I've got primary text there. And here it is, ancient Bibles. So NRSV, Hebrew Bible, NA28, uh, Guntigan Septuagint, Vulgate, Roths. The Dead Sea Scrolls, I put that in canonical order. Um, the Targums tagged module, Peshitta, Vedas Latina, and Samaritan Pentateuch. Okay, thanks. That's it for right now. Okay, cool. All right, next up is oh, I wanted this is important. I think it's important. I don't like to look at an ugly screen and I don't look like I don't like to look at ugly text. So if you look down here, I hope there's somebody in here that can appreciate the uh, symmetry between these fonts. Um, our, our Syriac is not, you know, set at 48 or 50 and our Hebrew is not gigantic with tiny Greek and Latin in English. I think it's important that these look good and they need to be small enough to to not have to scroll a bunch, right? And so I wanted to mention that for these texts, the default size is determined by what I want to see down here, all right? So in your program settings, you can set what your default is for a text. But, I mean, there's been some discussion of this in the forums. It, the numbers work out differently for Syriac and Hebrew compared to Greek and, and English. So my base is to set my text display in system and not system preferences, in accordance preferences. And I put it on 18 and 14. So the references show up at 14. The size of the text is 18. That only really works for Greek and Latin um, and, and English, Latin characters. For the Hebrew, I come in here and click the gear icon, hit 
set text plane pane display and change it to 27 and then change the this should be set to 14 like so and then i hit use default you want to make sure the theme stays default if you change your theme here and in, in these and when you're messing with settings you're going to get a nasty thing where when it switches to night mode these boxes are going to be white and instead of switching to night mode correctly and that is just an aesthetic nightmare so uh, I go through this list and set every Hebrew and Syriac in that way. I set the Syriac and Hebrew to 27 and then 18 for Greek and English. Verse references all to 14. And then I think it's pretty. And if you want to look at the whole thing together, again, remember that keyboard shortcut. Command option M. Magnify that zone out so you can see everything together. Isn't that amazing? And then command option M and you're back at it. You're ready to read. Get off the screen and back to the print text. Okay. Now that's everything. Let's move to the next question. The next question on the handout at the bottom of page three of the handout is where else does this word occur? So you hit Mishpatim here and you want to know where else that shows up because you, you're thinking like, is that a he, does that show up in the Dead Sea Scrolls? What would they mean by that word? Or haven't I seen this before in Exodus a few times? All I do is click one time on the word and boom, the word usage live click is there ready to go in fact i have seen it at this point multiple times in genesis and uh, and in exodus there's the one hit in exodus where we saw it before now once you're down here in the word usage live click tab you can just hit command down and look at how i'm scrolling through the primary hebrew uh, corpora so hebrew bible ben Syrah. Judean Desert uh, Hebrew, Mishnah, Northwest Semitic Inscriptions, and Qumran. Uh, notice another thing as I scroll through these results. Um, the hits section right here gives me a quick overview of where they show up the most. So I can see already that there's 425 hits in the Hebrew Bible, Ben Syrah uh, 31, etc this is the kind of information that you get in dch right here at the beginning of the entry so for mishpat when i go there dch tells me similar numbers uh, but that what this means is you can do this you can get this kind of data you don't have to have dch you can do this with greek and with latin and with 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 any other language you're working with just by clicking it and letting live click look up the word in the text you're in and other text. Now, when I say other text, you're gonna get 14,000 down here if you're not careful, and that's not helpful, right? If, if your information is cluttered, it's not helpful. So how do we get it to show just, like I said, primary Hebrew bodies of literature? Well, that comes in to another user group, and I, I really only use two. Again, we took a look at the ancient versions, I think I called it, and here's the primary texts. Uh, so, ancient Bibles was the other one. For primary texts, let's take a look at those. This is a user group that is focused on things that I would be interested in if I'm looking for word counts. Um, what would I be interested in if I look up a Greek or Hebrew word and seeing like a concordance of these? this body of literature. So we've got Hebrew Bible, Roths for Greek. We've got Apocryphal, Gospels, Apocalypses, Acts. We've got all the other tagged Greek uh, texts uh, there, the Desert Fathers. Any other literature that you might have, get the primary version. Hebrew inscriptions, uh, Roths parallels, not just the main Roths text, Mishnah, um, Etc. For Aramaic, the um, the Egyptian documents from Aramaic are there. Um, so that's what that looks like. With the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew, the ones they found the most important was the Hebrew Bible, Ben Syrah, the inscriptions in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's what shows up here for various words. You can expand that further um, by using this method to get other bodies of literature too. I mean, most often I'm not jumping down there 
but it's just nice to be able to scroll through and see what you know how many times the word shows up in other places so usually when I triple click a, or single click a word like that I'm just in for, in, interested in what the Hebrew Bible has and really probably what I'm looking for is where did I just see that or how many times what what passage was that that I just saw this word like I know it was like earlier this week in my reading where did that word show up and again if you don't remember anything from this webinar option command M to magnify that zone and check it out in more detail and then option command M to minimize it okay um, in the question that we were trying to answer when we jump down here is where else does this word occur live clicking and jumping to the word usage tab is one way to do it another way to do it is to double click double click in accordance is it's a selection uh, command so when you double click a word it's it um, it highlights that word so when we double click and hit option four I learned this from a webinar on amplifying uh, and I'm forget was it is Jordan I think is the gentleman that did the amplifying webinar I can't remember but it was super helpful command four or on Windows it's control four what that does is it takes the the lexical form and it searches it. Notice there's an extra Hebrew Bible tab up here now. Um, and instead of jumping down here where I can't hover and get information, here I'm still in a search tab and um, I can see all the lexical forms. So if I then want to add in instant details at the bottom, I can you know let, hover over a word and move through the results quickly. I find that super helpful. Not there's there's an extra benefit as well. You can search phrases this way. So what if I don't want to find just mishpatim, but I want to find ale mishpatim, right? So then I can highlight the phrase and hit command for, and there we go. There's only one of those. Let me find another one. Let's see something that might be helpful. Well, if you just give me an example here, we'll give to him command four. There we go. So now we've found that phrase and we could take off suffix. That would probably be helpful as well and rerun the search. Searching phrases this way um, is really helpful. All right, guys, um, I think that's where I want to stop uh, for another round of questions. We're almost done with this all the things workspace. Are there any other questions? Um, no, I'm not seeing any. Awesome. All right. Well, let me finish it out then with another question. What about commentaries and grammars, etc.? So, the the sh when you're reading, and you wonder what so and so has to say about the passage, or what would a reputable scholarly source have to say about the passage? Um, I've got the info pane added at the bottom. And I've gone, I went ahead and made room for the resource pop-up. So if I want to check out the new Oxford Annotated Study Bible, I just click, and there it is, ready to go. Um, again, Word Biblical, I click, and it's ready. Anchor's ready. And what about apparatuses? Well, again, scroll down, click your apparatus, and there it is. Um, grammars here, we've got grammatical information on these passages, at least these grammars mention this passage. So if I want to see what Waltke O'Connor has to say, I can click. It opens over here, which is right for a command, option M, and then I can check out that entry. Also, manuscript images are there ready to go. If you want to check out Leningrad itself, it's all right there for quick reference. However, sometimes, let me get that uh, instant details out of there. Sometimes you want more extensive reading. You want to kick back and actually read a whole section of a commentary on a pericope. So for that, you could command click. So if we if we get this ready to go, and let's say we want to read Word Biblical more extensively. If you command click, it'll open it over here, and then you could magnify that zone and read. Here's the problem, though. This 
commentary is tied to my text. So if I go skipping around and reading in here, it's going to mess up the linking of my text because this window is going to move with it. And so that's not really what I do to answer that question. If I want to read a commentary or a grammar extensively, what I would do is just open a uh, separate workspace for that. So if you go to File and Open Workspace, um, I've got a lot of workspaces here dedicated to single resources. So when I click on AYBC, that's going to open the Anchor Yale Bible Commentary, and I've got all the Anchor Yale Bible Commentaries here ready to go. So then I can navigate to my passage, and I can read freely without messing up anything on my primary reading workspace. There's other ways to do this. Uh, you could use the Research tab, and you could search all your commentaries for a verse. But I like to be in the actual resource itself, the module, so that I can highlight and uh, just move about freely like you would by pulling a book off the shelf. Once you're done with Anchor, you can close it out and you're still ready to roll. So this bottom zone is for quick information. That's how it's set up. All right, that's it. That's all the things workspace. On the handout, you'll notice there's a blog post dedicated to discussing these things. Uh, um, before, yeah. Yeah, before you get there, uh, someone said, I missed how you set up the part four space in the workspace. Could you show that again? Uh, which, which one was it again? The part four space. I'm assuming the bottom right hand oh, corner. Oh, this down here? Okay, so let me just show you. What I would want to do is click Add Parallel, put the info pane up, and then I would click the gear and move it down. And then I would go ahead and let it open uh, a resource, and then I would move that resource down, and then just scoot this thing over. Now we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, was that the space you were thinking of, uh, Joseph? Let me make sure I got the right one there from him. Okay, we can continue on until I The reason I was thinking that one is because you said the fourth one or space four. So I was here, one, two, three, four. Okay. Um, for these on the bottom right, um, if, if those are not set up, then I would just let it run a live click and it'll pop it down there for you. And then run another live click on the word and then just drag that tab up there like so. And now you're ready to go. Okay, he said, I meant the fourfold division of the screen. Aha, all right, let me show you that. Let's open a new workspace. I'm gonna use Control-2 to jump over to uh, a Greek text, and I'm gonna make that a little bigger. This is where I start most frequently is with a blank workspace. I'm gonna triple click to open up a lexicon. Uh, then I'm gonna go ahead and lie, I can go ahead and set up my info pane, info, move down, click a resource, move it down. Uh, might make this up a little higher, scoot this over, and now we're gonna live click and live click and combine. Voila. This would drive me crazy, so I'm going to make these same height. There we go. All good? I think so. Thank you. This is recorded, so remember, we can, you can watch that again. Hey, guys, look at this toolbar. There's hardly anything on it because I don't like the toolbar to be having all the little icons there. I most frequently hit Command Option 0 and hide that thing. And that way, my little 13-inch screen at least is a little bit taller now. And the to hide and show, it's Command Option Zero, and that toolbar will just zip around like so. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I want to jump into the next question. The next question focuses on Septuagint and Hebrew Bible um, equivalents. If you read both the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible, 
this question frequently comes up. You see a word and you wonder, well, what would the Septuagint do? And so how do you get an answer to that question? I'm going to close this workspace down and show you where we are in the handout. Oh, before we jump there, remember uh, I was telling you that there's a blog post for each of these. For the All the Things workspace, there's the link to the blog uh, on that. Also, all the workspaces that you see discussed here, they're on this blog post, Accordance Workspace Series. If I click that, uh, it should take you right to here. So we've already covered point number one, and we're moving on to the second one now. All right. Here is where we are, text workspace. So I called it the text workspace because that's the command you use. I've got this set up in a saved workspace. I tell you what, let me go ahead and reopen the one we were in. Because if you have this set up and then your question arises, well, um, what would the Hebrew Bible say? Then all I would do, I would leave that workspace open and ready to go and just open your saved workspace for the text command. So here's what that looks like. Uh, this workspace is set up for finding equivalents similar to what you would get in Hatch and Redpath and Murioka. If you take a look at the handout, you'll see that I've linked to two resources. Now, those some of you guys are familiar with these resources, I know, because you've used them. Um, others of you, let me show you what these are. If I click on the Hatch and Redpath link, it takes you to a two-volume concordance, which I think was last published in the late 80s by Baker. It's out of print. Um, I used to have a print company, and I sold it, and I wished I hadn't. Um, it's blasphemy in some circles to sell your Hatch and Redpath. Uh, but check out what this thing does. It's not based on the latest editions. Um, so you look up a Greek word. I'm going to try to zoom in here so we can see it a little better. Yes, you look up a Greek word, and then it tells you right here the Hebrew equivalents. So for Alephane, there's our Hebrew equivalents, if y'all can see that. And then it's going to give you a concordance of the Septuagint listings, and it's going to tell you right here which word is behind it. So for all the instances of this word, you look for two beside the reference. And that's how this works. And these are big. It's, it's either one big volume that's about four inches thick or it's two smaller volumes about, you know, two inches thick. And, and that's how it works. Now, Murayoka has updated this in this slim volume. So this is just an index that essentially you can look up a Greek word and see the Hebrew equivalent or the Hebrew word and see the Greek equivalent. And that's all it does. It's not a concordance like Hatch and Redpath. This is a supplement to Hatch and Redpath. So you either go on Abe Books and you buy you a Hatch and Redpath for about $100 or $200. And then you buy your Murioka updated index, which is another 60 euros. And then you're ready to do what we can do with accordance. And I want to show you how to do finding these parallels. These are the scholarly tools that are accepted by all, even those that aren't big fans of digital resources. Um, the workspace, yeah, let's let's take a look at the workspace and let me show you how to use accordance to do this. All right, let's look at the, let's take an overview of what we see here. In zone one at the top, we have three tabs. There's English ones that I've called English equivalents, there's Hebrew equivalents and Greek equivalents. This English one is just a bonus tab. Um, the reason I relabeled these is because it's really easy to forget what you're doing. Where do I search for what? Um, there's there's essentially, there's, there's two, I got a note here. I want to look it up in the uh, handout. You, the Hebrew equivalence tab searches for a Greek word inside of a Hebrew text, okay? The Greek equivalence workspace searches for a Hebrew word inside of a Greek text, all right, the Septuagint. What makes this possible is the MTLXX parallel tool. You've gotta have that to do this. So 
that is the correspondence between the two is with the HMTW4 text and then Roth's Septuagint, LXX1. So if you're looking for Hebrew equivalents, let's say you're reading the Septuagint and you're wondering, I see the word katabino in my text in the Septuagint. What, what Hebrew words does that usually translate? Well, the way that you set that up is by opening your text workspace. Go to Hebrew equivalents because, again, that's what we're looking for. And I set, set this up with the HMT4 text, uh, HMTW4 text. And then all we got to do is run the uh, text command. So it's command option or no, command shift T. We want to select... Septuagint. We want to insert a lexical form, katabino, and hit OK and hit Go. And that runs the search. Immediately, I've got my analysis window over here that shows me an overview of the equivalents. OK, the way that that you get that to pop up is by clicking here. And selecting analysis. If your analysis window doesn't look like this, click the gear icon, customize display, and you want to make sure that you have. That your your uh, first column looks like this. Now, when you're. When, once you can survey your results, you can immediately see that your rod is the word, right? 259 hits on your rod. So that's the most common occurrence. If your instance, however, in your passage is actually bow, then you can see that's rare, right? Because usually it's your rod that is translating. And let's say we want to find these instances. Where is it bow? Where does katabino translate that word? Well, all you got to do is come up here. And I've got this in the handout. I think I put this in here where you just put at. Yes, that's there in the handout. All you have to do is hit at. I think this is going to work. It might not. Let's see what this does. Nope, I got to redo this. So the, you get the order gets off. So let's do... Let's do a text search and the Septuagint for Katabino and hit OK. And then let's do at lexical form. Uh oh, here it is. Command L to pull up the lexical form browser. I'll type my word, hit enter. Oh, I'll put it in twice. Oh dear. Let's try one more time. Command L, put in my lexical form. There it is. And hit enter. There's the two hits. I found the words that Katabino translates, and then I limited it down to bow to see the two hits where it's translating bow. Down below, I've got the MTLX parallel because some um, Tove has uh, comments down here on differences between the texts, and sometimes it, it helps to look look at those. Um, I like to have that ready to roll, so we can go the other way, right? Let's say we're reading Hebrew, and we wonder, well, what would the Septuagint? What does it normally do with this word? So, in order to do that. All we would do is hit Command Shift T, and this time we're going to search the Hebrew Bible, but we're displaying it in the, the Septuagint. What word do we want to find? Uh, we on the screen we've got Mashak. Uh, let's do Malak. I'm going to go to Insert Text Lexical Form. Malak. We don't. We want this one to rain, and we're going to hit OK and hit OK. Boom. Notice this up here, the Greek equivalents updated. And right away, we can tell that the most 
common word that it's used to translate malak is basilewo 299 times kai is in that alignment with it frequently obviously it doesn't it's not translated with kai that's just in the alignment frequently if you yeah you can see what i mean right here um, if we scroll down to that you can see that there's a vav on the front and so that's what that's representing so you gotta you, this is just an overview so if you want to scroll down what other verb is used genomai is in there a lot it's almost always uh, basilowo is there even another one i don't see another this one would be interesting uh me let's see what that's all about so to do that i'm just going to come up here and put at me and select it okay so there's these two hits with kathistemi uh, we can add in instant details if you want so you can see that is the same malak and then here we've got kathistemi so that would be something you might want to check out um, I save this workspace with the search results there. So I leave the search results in there so that next time I come, I don't have to, you know, I've got a, a jump start on how to run it. So again, you, you, you don't have to worry about messing anything up if you have saved workspaces. Again, it's just file, open workspace, text command, and I am ready to jump in and find equivalents, ready to roll. In the forums the other day, somebody asked, where are all the instances where uh, bait is, trans is translated against? If you have the NIV with the enhanced tagging, it lines up every single word and phrase. Um, so this is super helpful for that. It's really the best text. It might be the only text that does this. Um, you can run the text command here on the NIV. Command shift T. We're going to do Hebrew Bible. We're going to look for, I'm going to use this to enter lexical form so I can make sure I get not Aramaic, but Hebrew. And then what we want to do is put at against, if I remember how to do this right. And there it is. I can hover and see all the places where bait is translated against. We could do the same thing in, in, uh, with Greek. So let's say it's not, you're not worried about the Hebrew Bible. You want to find maybe where all, where pros is translated against. Let's enter the lexical form with insert text. Pros. Okay. I think this happens. And then we'll hit at against. Boom. Not helpful to have the Hebrew Bible here. Let's put the there it is, lest you strike your foot against a stone. All right, guys, that is how we find equivalence between texts. This is a new feature of a relatively new feature of accordance. On the blog, you'll see a much more convoluted way to get that information. Um, the old the old way was uh, was a lot harder. There is. I want to open this up for questions, but there is one more way that I want to show you for a quick overview. So let's say you're in the New Testament, and let's say you don't have any of this analysis stuff set up. You're just in a New Testament, uh, or Septuagint, and you want to find equivalents for uh, Poyeo. Double click Command 4 to search that text, and then all I'm going to do is... I think I need to hit analysis. That's a big one. Oh, yeah, it was really common. Yeah. When I pull up the analysis um, window here, the analysis analytics, I have my default analysis set up to show MTLXX correspondences. All right. So, and a lexical form. So, as soon as I put that in there, I see my lexical form Poyetos at 3,204 occurrences, and I can already see a quick overview of what words are used. Obviously, it's a sa 
almost all the time. Let's look at this word, which is less common. Uh, diacarizo. Uh, we don't want to do that. Double click, Command 4. And let's take a look at analysis. There it is. There's a quick overview of what's lined up with that word in the MTLXX parallel tool. That's a much quicker way that you can always do by just double clicking the word, hitting command four, and then showing analysis. Honestly, most of the time that's probably going to solve, uh, you know, satisfy your, your curiosity. But that text command workspace is for when you really want to dive deep for an exegetical paper or for you know, something that's just been eating you up about why in these two instances is Meshach translated with, you know, uh, Ectano. So, okay, now I'm done with what does the LXXMT do with this word? We're moving on to the next workspace. So let me ask, uh, open it up for questions. I don't see any right now. Awesome. Um, I want to almost want to ask am I moving too fast, but then I kind of don't because this is recorded and I don't want to slow down. So <laughs> you can always look back. Just if it's too much, too fast, just soak in the possibilities of what you can do and then go back through it. The accordance has a ton of beginner stuff um, posted for how do I get started on X, Y, and Z. I think we need more on advanced stuff um for original language readers and that's what i'm trying to help with so all right moving on infer workspace why would i jump to this workspace this is where you're trying to find similar wording between texts so we're reading in a print text and we um we we remember a place somewhere there's a place i know there's a place that is like psalm one talking about a tree planted by water so where is that in the Hebrew Bible. I would open up my infer workspace, ready to go. And here you can see that I've already run the search. When you're trying to find correspondences or similar wording, there's two parts. There's the tab where your passage is that you know about, right? I, this has Psalm 1-3, and notice that I set the verse range to Psalm 1-3. I come in here and I click the plus sign, range, not all text, Psalm 1-3. And then I look using the asterisk for all the words in Psalm 1-3. Asterisk means find me all the lexical forms. That's loaded up in accordance, all those lexical forms. And if I want to find out where is that in the Septuagint, right? What, where's similar wording to like a tree planted? Well, I open up another copy of the Septuagint, and I run the infer search, command shift I. I select Rolf's, oh no, I've got another tab open. Let me close my other browser so that they don't, it doesn't get confused and I don't pick the wrong one. Let's try that again, command shift I, and then I select Rolf's and hit okay. Now it's, it starts out by looking for six word strings. And there we go. That's all. There's a lot to look through. Notice what it's finding. A lot of irrelevant stuff. We can turn that down. Let's turn it down to five. All right. There is looking for five word strings. That's actually finding more, more hits. But it's still a lot. Like it says 800 hits. I'm not going to scroll through all that. I already know in my mind. I'm looking for places similar to Psalm 1:3. And it's, it does mention a tree, right? So all you got to do is come up here and use your lexical form browser, command L or on a Mac control L, and we'll type in the word tree. And then we'll put the and com command in there. I'm going to hit command shift A, and it's going to shoot the and command in there. Otherwise, just go to search command and and hit enter. Boom. Now we're down to 32 results, right? That's so much more helpful. Then I can scroll through here and I'm finding similar wording with tree in it. And I, there it is, Jeremiah 17, 8 from the 
electionary recently, and it will be like a tree. Now that's not the same word for planted, um, but it will be like a tree. And then we can we can read through here and see if that's the hit. And in fact, it is. So I add in a parallel here, text. Let's see here. I know it's in here somewhere. I thought that was it. Oh, yes. Yes, he shall be like a tree thriving beside water. So similar, not exactly the same, but that's it. That's exactly what I was looking for. Now, I've used this I've used this in the, in the past on um, papers and presentations, and I found it super helpful. Um, you can do this between any text. It doesn't have to be the same two texts, any two tagged texts. In the handout, um, if you scroll down, you'll notice two things I want to point out. I gave you two other instances, one with finding the Hebrew Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls and one with finding the New Testament and the Didache. Those are blog posts that have a video on both of them on how to get it set up. So that's there for you. Um, there is a print resource that does this same kind of thing. So if you go to Biblical Quotate, that link, this resource came out um, not too long ago. And what it's done is Second Temple scholars have taken a tool like Accordance and they've tried to find places that they would call either quotations or allusions to the Hebrew Bible in Second Temple literature. Uh, but you can, this is a $125 book and it's just a list, all right? So it's just a list of like cross references. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you can do in accordance yourself and tweak the search results uh, to find your own allusions and quotations and citations. And it's it's something that's uh, really helpful. I just used it this week on a sermon uh, when I was looking for other places similar to um, uh, poor, like in Matthew. So I was looking back in Luke, in Luke 6, uh, 17 and following, where Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who weep. So I was looking for similar wording to that in the Septuagint. And even for something like a sermon, something practical, not just some you know, obscure paper that you're writing, it can be super helpful. All right, guys, that is the similar wording workspace. Any questions? Uh, there's a comment. Uh, does inquire require? I'm sorry. Does infer require the text to use the same character set? And I think by character set you mean the same language, or do you are you thinking like Syriac Hebrew Bible? Let's see. Let me see. Give him a moment to put that back to type that in. While we're waiting on that, if you need to, uh, yeah, continue with yeah. Something. you can interrupt me at any point to come back to that. The next thing I want to show you is uh, Old Testament text workspace, and I said this was my favorite. Um, the blog post is there that walks you through what I'm going to show you here. Um, but I want to show you this, which is not, I don't think I put this on the blog post, and that is why you might turn here uh, in a, as, a, in a, as opposed to just using a live click. So if let's just open a, an accordance text, a basic text here, and let's say we're in the Hebrew Bible. And we want to find um, what other versions have to say. We can just use a live click and get the information we need 95% of the time. But sometimes you want to put together something more extensive. So here, if I can, if this iCloud link works, is an example. Let's 
let's see, this is a handout and it is not wanting to open. Not going to open. So let's just go to the paper. That's not going to open either. Let's go here. All right, here's an example. Oh, where's the table? Where's the table? I want to show you the table. It's a beautiful table. Here it is. <laughs> this is a, an extensive table of witnesses that, that organizes all the different readings in Isaiah 8.11 for this word into Hebrew sources, uh, Greek sources. Notice not just the Septuagint, but Aquila, Symmachus, Theodosian. It's a... Uh, a Vulgate, a Syriac, and Aramaic uh, Targums, and it lines them all up. So then we can think about how which reading might be the most original um, and what could have caused the rise of the other ones. This is step one for in, sorting through any Old Testament textual critical problem. So we gathered the readings, we analyzed them, and we reconstructed what the Hebrew would have been underneath. Uh, these readings. Then you can sort out, um, okay, group your witnesses and think about how would this one have arisen if Sewer was first, or how would Sewer have arisen if Yasar is first, and vice versa. All right. So for that, you need more than just this quick overview. And what I like to do is go to a saved workspace that I call OT Texts. And from here, not only can I see the most common versions, but I can also see uh, Symmachus, Theodosian, um, Aquila, and I can see the uh, Vedas Latina, which again is based on the Septuagint. And I know that if I go to Isaiah 8.11, you can see from the apparatus down here at the bottom, uh, this is set to the Pentateuch. We need to change this. You can't, I can't have it where it auto jumps to everything perfectly. Sometimes we're going to have to tweak this apparatus uh, to go to the right one. We want the one for Isaiah, not the Pentateuch, because we're in Isaiah. So there we go. Now, let's walk through each of these. We've got the Hebrew Bible here. We've got the Dead Sea Scrolls module. Um, we've got the Targums and the Syriac Peshitta. Over here, we've got the Göttingen Septuagint text with its reading, its, its odd reading. We've got the second apparatus of the Göttingen Septuagint, which is extremely important for this purpose. Um, with the second apparatus, it catalogs not just variants within the stream of the Old Greek, like what different scribes said, but it, the second apparatus categorizes or it, it lists for you alternate Greek versions apart from the Septuagint, like Symmachus and Aquila. And where is Theodosian? I know he's in here. Right here is Theodosian, right? And what he had. So these are later translations of the Septuagint that adjust it in various ways, like the difference between an ESV and a New King James and a NASB and an NIV. So these are super important because these other versions um, of the Greek Old Testament, they influence the stream of how the, um, the Septuagint, quote unquote, is transmitted. They influence the Greek transmission uh, and translations of the Old Testament. And so you really need to see what they have. Um, if you're going to do an exhaustive study of an Old Testament reading. We've got the Vulgate text, which is going to most often line up with the Hebrew. And then we've got um, the Vedas Latina. I was so excited when one day this just showed up in accordance uh, on the website not too long ago. This is a super obscure resource that's not easy to track down. I mean, you can probably find a PDF that's really difficult to use online. Putting together this list right here, this screen that you see in a theological library is a real, uh, you don't you want to talk about friction. It is a real pain in the neck to track down all these sources. You're going to have to get a copy of uh, the Peshitta, which uh, is super expensive and published by Brill to get this text. Uh, Vedas Latina, there's, there's old copies of this as well. Um, you know, the Göttingen Septuagint is extremely expensive in print. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, having those 
um, you, you, you're going to have to go to the dead the discoveries in the Judean desert, um, or Ulrich's uh, gathering. And this book here has all the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls from discoveries in the Judean desert. But again, this book, book is super expensive as well. And so tracking all these down in print is, is very challenging. Um, okay. Between this complicated workspace, which is it's not complicated to make. All you do is hit add parallel, right? I opened a Hebrew Bible and I just hit add parallel and added all the sources and lined them up in a way that makes sense to me. Bring in your instant details if you want uh, to check out these words. I like to have something between this and just the simple uh, live click solution. And so between the two, I've got one called uh, OT6. So here, it's going to be the six that I'm most interested in, not just Vulgate, Septuagint, Hebrew Bible, but also the Dead Sea Scrolls um, and the Peshitta and the Aramaic Targums. So, and they're all lined up in parallel, which is super nice. Uh, it's not like, you know, stacks on top and bottom. So that's another one you can have. When you want to get to this, you don't always have to just open it and then navigate. You don't have to do that. Um, let's say you're in your um, highly complicated all the things workspace. Let's go to all the things. And let's say we want to jump to OT6 because as we're reading, we're in Isaiah 21 and we want to see what the versions have for this in more detail than what we get down here. I'm going to two finger click on Exodus 21. I'm going to go to my workspaces and hit OT6. And there it is, Exodus 21. Jump straight to it. I can see what I want to see. Okay, nothing interesting here. Close her down and keep reading. All right, that is the OT6 workspace. Now, I think hopefully um, there some people might want more information on the different versions of the Old Testament. There is an awesome book for that, and I think I've got a workspace just for him. Uh, maybe not. Let me open from my library then. This book. We This was a book that we had to read in school. Uh, Textual Criticism of the Hebrew Bible by Emanuel Tov. When this third edition came out, we had to read it again and, and go through it in a seminar. You can go here to titles and we can put in, let's say you want to know more about that Simicus I mentioned. Well, you can type that in in Tov and go to a page dedicated to these versions. Here's the entry on Simicus, and it'll talk to you about that version. Let's say you wanna know more about the uh, Syriac Peshitta, or let's say, oh, if I can remember how to spell Peshitta, it's been a long time. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Uh, we have P-E-N. Oh, oh, page numbers. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the problem. Oh, brother. I think there's two T's. Look at that. I was right. Page 150. And here we go. The Targum to the Prophets. We got Targum information. Bam! There is a whole entry here, a whole article on the Peshitta. And you can find out background. How is it relevant to Old Testament textual criticism? This book is a fabulous guide to orient yourself on what is this whole business about all these different versions in Old Testament textual criticism. Um, so that's what I would recommend for more info there. In the handout, you'll also see something else super cool. Uh, but wait a minute, what's happening? Get this, uh, boom, boom, there we go. Let's go jump over here to the handout and let me show you something right quick. There's a link down at the bottom of this section to an e-academy session that Emmanuel Tove did where he talked about textual criticism and using accordance. Um, so check that out um, as well. It's about an hour long. I think I've watched it three times just because hearing him talk about uh, textual criticism, it just makes me, motivates me to sit down. It's like watching a Rocky movie to get pumped up before you play a, a game or something. Watching Tove talk about textual criticism gets me pumped up to sit down and do the hard work of reading 
Hebrew and Greek and things. All right, questions before we jump into a simpler reading workspace. Okay, uh, back on that question about uh, infer requiring the same character set, uh, the Latin character set, he said. Okay. Um, it, I'm trying to think. Yes, you could do like an NIV and an ESV if you mean Latin characters in the sense of like English letters. Yeah, you could search for um, all the hits of the, the the NIV for a certain word within the ESV. It would have to be, I think, it would have to be the same characters. Yes. Okay, another question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, did you use Word or Malel to construct the table? That went through multiple editions. Uh, one edition was in Melel, and then I redid it in Word. So, both. Okay, that's all for now. All right. Um, what I want to do is I want to look at a simplified reading companion. When I open um, Accordance, First thing that pops up is a text and sometimes I just open the text that I'm reading let's say I'm in Exodus right now so let's say we're in Exodus and today I want to read I don't like it when it highlights the verse reference so I like to navigate via the navigation box at the bottom down there Exodus 26 and oh it's still there I got to get that out of there okay Exodus 26 you say that's a little obsessive compulsive Maybe. Uh, Exodus 26, I navigate there from the bottom right, and now I'm ready to read. So instead of setting up a super complex workspace, um, I like to sometimes just open a text and let it evolve as the questions arise. Because if you know about live click and triple clicking, clicking the lexicons, you can accomplish a whole lot without such a complicated workspace. Um, on the handout, I listed out some really common questions. 95% of the time, what you see listed there under answering the most important questions is all that I need in a reading session. So what would another version say? I wonder if anybody remembers how to do that. All right, if you have live click set up and you've got your word usage tab ready to roll and you've got your verse lookup tab ready to roll with your custom groups that have the text there that you want to see, I mean, it's, it's one click away. So what would another version say? Just click a verse reference, and there it is. Maybe maybe I'll just stick with that, and that'll be all that I need. Other times, though, I'm going to want to look up Ankalas. So triple click, and there's my entry in Brildag. All right, if I want to see a different lexicon, let's say I want to see BDAG, I can run through. Well, it's not in BDAG because it's yeah, – there's LEH. Maybe I want to see Little and Scott. I might leave that open or I might just close it out when I'm done. So um, let's say I mean, another super common question would be where else does the word occur? I can click on Ankulas there, Ankulas, and I can see it in all the instances in Rolfs. Um, and if I want to see Eusebius and Apocryphal Acts, it's there, but usually I'm just going to want to see what's in the Septuagint. Take a look at that, and then I can keep moving. Um, finally, if I wanted to know what a commentary said in this sort of simplified MO, again, we're using this as a companion to a print text, I would probably take this window here, this zone, and shrink it down a little bit, and then I would probably just add in a commentary. If I want to see, let's go to Reference Tools, Commentary, and grab Anchor. I might pull it in like so. And then I can do my highlighting and whatnot. I can check it out, um, close it back out, and then start from scratch. So it's super flexible. You know, if you just open it and use live click and triple clicking, you can get most of what you need um, that way. But this right here, this verse lookup live click um, is super powerful. So that takes care of most of the most common needs for everyday reading. 
one last question that I want to help you answer before we go to a different setup, one that's designed just for digital reading. One last question is, let's go back to that ankulas word. Where was that? That was in the beginning of 26, right here. Let's, I think it was right here, ankulas. For, if you couldn't remember exactly where that was, there's one of the new features is the find um, command F or on Windows control F. I could switch my keyboard to Greek and type in on Kulas, and I think it'll find it. Will it not? Um, did I not spell it right? On oh, that's a G. That sound on Kulas. There we go. A gamma. There it is. Boom. And it'll highlight it for me. Now, what if I want to know? All right, I see that this only shows up uh, how many times? 11 times in the Septuagint. Is this a common word outside of the Bible? What about in classical Greek? So to do that, I would two click, a two finger click for a Mac or right click for if you're using a mouse or Windows. And then I would go down to websites and select Lageon. So Lageon is a website that uh, I think it's Helma Deek at the University of Chicago's that, that is behind this. And she's put together this super cool frequency section that comes right at the beginning of the entry. And it says it shows up fewer than 50 times. So we know that this loop word is not common at all. But what about the word qubit, right? Let's check that one out. Let's go to website. I'm going to show you how to set it up to jump to this in just a second. Oh, look, it's in the top 2000. So qubit is actually common outside of biblical Greek. Um, what about measure? Let's find one that's that's super common. Uh, website. Lageon. Oh, we almost got into the top 1,000. All right. Don't you want to know how, chi, how, free, how frequent chi is? It's got to be number one, right? Oh. Website. Lageon. Boom. It's the second. Oh, what is the most common? Oh, it's got to be the article. Let's try that. Website, log on. Oops. Oh, that's not right. What? Why did it? Oh, that's the wrong word. That look for O. Oh. Well, I think it's the article. Anyways, you guys get the point. Website, log on. Still looking for the wrong O. Okay. So how did we get this set up to jump to log on? Well, if you open your accordance preferences and you go to external websites, you can add a new one by hitting new. You can title it log on, and this is what you want to put in. So that essentially is the URL with nothing else after it, asterisks after it. So that will let you let accordance autofill what goes there, and it'll put in the lexical form for you. So I put that in the handout, that hyperlink with the asterisks. That's what you want to do to be able to jump. Now, the Perseus word study tool is another one that I'll jump to sometimes. So especially if I'm in an untagged text. If, let's say, we're reading and I look up that hooks word, and then there's a mention to um, classical literature, and I jump to that. So let's see, where do we have a good? I think we have this, yes. So Accordance has a module called Classics, uh, Greek Classics, and it's got stuff like Strabo's Geography in there. If I wanted to check this out, and then I wanted to look up a word in here, this is not a tagged text. What you can do is two finger click and go to website, Perseus Word Study Tool, and then it'll open that up for you, and it'll tell you the parsing information here. You can even pull up LSJ and and use it that way. So that's kind of helpful as well. That's the kind of thing the uh, that might seem like somewhat of a rabbit that you're chasing as you're reading, but chasing rabbits is good sometimes. Okay, uh, let's take a, any questions. Let's take a break for questions, and then I'm going to jump into the last thing. No questions. No questions. All right. 
Well, the last thing I want to do is shift gears. Um, the last thing is digi a digital reading workspace. Now, the whole webinar has been focused primarily on using Accordance as a reading companion, a tool that you turn to when questions arise as you're reading a print text. So sometimes, however, it's beneficial to read from Accordance. And you need a setup for that, right? You don't want your text to be 18 or even 24 points. If you're if you're talking about Hebrew, 24 would be too small. 18 is too small for, for English and Greek. If you're going to read it from your lap, think about your computer screen sitting in your lap. Um, I save a workspace for this purpose. So if I go to Accordance and I click File, Open Workspace, I've got... A simple LXX, simple Hebrew Bible, simple Vulgate, and an ESV lectionary. Sometimes you want to do your lectionary reading, and you need a good English Bible setup. I don't normally have book titles and section titles on, but for this one, I do have it set up to show those things. Because I'm trying to replicate what a good print Bible would look like. And so here I can do my reading, and that's it. It's ready to go. Um, close it out and move on with the next thing. Let me show you before I close that out. Uh, it's not just that I've got the titles on, I've got the text set to paragraphs. You can toggle, rather than showing individual verses, this is grouped by paragraph. You can toggle that with Command Shift P or V, verses, Command Shift P to go to paragraphs. I think that is what everybody's default command is. Um, on one of my computers, I have it Command Option P, but I think the default is Command Shift P and Command Shift V to toggle between verses and paragraphs. Uh, another thing about this is I switch to a serifed font away from the default, like Lotto or whatever the default one is that doesn't have serifs, and I made it a little bit of a heavier weight. Uh, this is the Accordance font, and so all of those things are just under Command T. Right. This is a custom theme. My one computer over here just shifted to dark mode. If this won't shift to dark mode, because this is a custom setup with a certain font and these sorts of things. Um, because if I'm doing this, I probably am. It's probably daytime. That's just a preference for me. Um, if I'm if I'm pulling this up, it's probably during the daytime. So I'm not worried about dark mode. All right. That's a good uh, English Bible reading on the go setup. Uh, let's look at a couple original language uh, set, setups. Simple LXX. This is for reading the Septuagint when I'm away and I don't have Rolfs with me. So we've got a, a Nets Bible with big font uh, set up right beside me. I've got the information window open so I can hover and see a quick gloss. I want you to notice in the information or the instant details down below. There's not a lot of extraneous detail in there. It's got the lexical form, the root information, and then the parsing information with the gloss. So I turned off a lot of the other stuff that I don't care about. Um, I don't want to see the text form down there. I can see the text form in the text. I don't need to see sum kalupton beside sum kalupto. Just show me the lexical form, the parsing information, and the gloss. So you set that up, I think, here in instant details. You tell it what you want to show. So dictionary form, parsing, uh, that's, that's the main things. And then the gloss, English gloss definition. Now, with this, the text is big. And I do leave it in the verse format so that it lines up with English. Um, and I can easily let my eyes jump over here to see... Um, what a translation would say, and this is how I would read uh, the Septuagint on the go. Similarly, we've got a Hebrew Bible one that is nice and big, lines up well, and is, is easy to read on the go. Guys, apart from just being on the go, sometimes when you're in these temple passages, like in Exodus where I am, sometimes the, the high frequency vocab is few and far between, and a setup like this can help you move. The Hebrew Bible is repetitive enough that you're going to get repetitions just by continuing to read. You know, I don't need to sit here and make a note card and um, 
you know, study the word for 10 minutes before I keep reading. Um, and I've got the English to the side, but I mean, the Hebrew takes up half a screen. I can easily focus over here without looking over here. Um, I don't believe in, in, in cheating and in reading the Hebrew Bible and Greek anyways. I don't, I, when I say I don't believe in cheating, I don't, I, I'm saying I don't believe that's a thing. All right. Uh, I've been teaching second people, second languages for about 10 years now. And the idea that you can cheat by looking at a translation is just in my humble opinion, uh, not the way it works. What you need is repetitions that you understand. And a diglot with the English right beside the text gives you understanding so that you can keep reading and get more repetitions. And that's how you learn a language, is by hearing it over and over and over in ways you understand, um, not by spending five minutes flipping lexicon pages. Although I love them, I've got a whole shelf full of glorious lexicons that I absolutely love. They're my favorite thing in the world besides the Bible. So I'm all about that too. But that's a Hebrew Bible reading setup. So let's see. Um, I think that brings the content I wanted to cover to an end. Um, I'm looking through the notes here to see if there was anything else I wanted to touch on there. I think that's it. So this is what it looks like to read in when the when the vocab's hard. You can just keep moving with the information. Uh, I just want to call it the information window. The instant details, guys. This is something that drew me to accordance. Look at how fast it populates. It's absolutely amazing. That instant details window at the bottom. I mean, it turns this into a combined diglot and reader's text. And I think that's so underrated, um, just how easy and pretty this is to look at. This is a comfortable reading size that you set the computer in your lap, and you can really read for a long time. Um, so I really appreciate that. All right, let me turn the camera on, and if I can figure out how to get go to meeting to show me all the windows. And Linda, I'm going to ask you again if we've got any questions. There is one question. Uh, can you repost the link for searching with the uh, Perseus Word Study tool? Uh, he could not find it in the handout. I Good did enough. mention to uh, it, it might be in the link because you keep that link updated. Yes, I did not put it uh, in there. So let me show you what that was. Let's see, where do we need to go? We need to go to external websites. And here it is. I tell you what, that's a lot. You, you uh, can put, put that in the chat box if you wanted to there. Oh, yeah, that's a good call. I can't get the go to meeting to show me those windows again, the controls. That's my problem. It, I hid them, and now they're oh, gone. Uh, click on the, yeah, right there. Just click on that. Ah, uh, here we go. And so the chat box is... Um. Here it is. Okay. So, all right, that's what I've got in there. Hey guys, I hope that was helpful. I hope that wasn't too much um, or too little, but I appreciate it. You uh, slash several years ago, it's by Oxford University Press. It's in accordance. It's weird in that it's a really awkward translation. The philosophy behind it is um, a little, it produces a translation that's not very smooth in places, and that's by design. I just put up a tweet recently, though, about Exodus how, and how good Exodus is. Um, the scholar behind that is just outstanding, and um, he, he, his translations are much more smooth than Exodus, and um, so NETS is it, N-E-T-S. And you can find PDFs of that online or the accordance module. Uh, Brenton is the old one from the 1800s, I think. Um, there's another one um, that is published by Lexham, and it's really good as well. But it's not based on, NETS is based on Rolf's as the source text when there's no Göttingen volume. Otherwise, it's based on Göttingen, which is the critical editions. Um, so I use NETS.